Welcome back everybody to our lecture on deep learning. Today we want to go into the topic. We want to introduce some of the important concepts and theories that have been fundamental to the field. Today's topic will be feedforward networks and feedforward networks are essentially the main configuration of neural networks as we use them today. So in the next couple of videos, we want to talk about the first models and some ideas behind them. We also introduce a bit of theory. One important block will be about universal function approximation, where we will essentially show that neural networks are able to approximate any kind of function. This will then be followed by the introduction to the softmax function and some activations. In the end, we want to talk a bit how to optimize such parameters and in particular, we will talk about the backpropagation algorithm. There's an old saying, and I don't know who brought it up first, uh, which says, there is nothing more practical than a good theory. So let's start with the model and what you've already heard about is the perceptron. We've already talked about this, which was essentially a function that would map any high dimensional input into an inner product of the weight vector and the input. Then we are only interested in the signed distance that is computed. You can interpret this essentially as you see on the right hand side. The decision boundary is shown in red and what you're computing with the inner product is essentially a signed distance of a new sample to this decision boundary. If we consider only the sign, we can decide whether we are on the one side or the other. Now, if you look at classical pattern recognition and machine learning, we would still follow a so-called pattern recognition pipeline. We have some measurement that is converted and pre-processed in order to increase the quality let's say, decrease the noise. In the pre-processing, we essentially stay in the same domain as the input. So if you have an image as input, the output of the pre-processing will also be an image, but probably with better properties towards the classification task. Then we want to do feature extraction. You remember the example with the apples and the pears. From these, we extract features which then result in some high dimensional vector space. Which is basically a vector space representation summing up uh, the input from all sensors. Th that doesn't, does not show any pictures. We can then go ahead and do the classification. Now what we've already seen with the perceptron is that we are able to model linear decision boundaries. This immediately then led to the observation that perceptrons cannot solve the logical exclusive OR or the so-called XOR. You can see the visualization of the XOR problem here on the left hand side. So imagine you had some kind of distribution of classes where on the top left and the bottom right is blue and the other class is bottom left and top right. This is inspired by the logical XOR function you will not be able to separate those two point clouds with a single linear decision boundary. So you either need curves or you use multiple lines. With a single perceptron, you will not be able to solve the problem. Because people have been arguing, look, we can model logical functions with perceptrons. If we build perceptrons on perceptrons, we can essentially build all of logic. Now, if you can't build XOR, then you're probably not able to describe the entire logic and therefore we will never achieve strong AI. This was a period of time when all funding to artificial intelligence was tremendously cut down and people would not get any new grants. They would not get money to support the research. Hence, this period became known as the AI winter. And winter is coming. Things change with the introduction of the multilayer perceptron. This is now the expansion of the perceptron. You do not just do a single neuron, but you use multiple of those neurons and you arrange them in layers. So here you can see a very simple draft. So this is very similar to the perceptron. 
you have essentially some inputs and some weights. Now you can see that it's not just a single sum, but we have several of those sums that go through a nonlinearity. Then they assign weights again and summarize again to go into another nonlinearity. This is very interesting because we can use multiple neurons. We can now also model nonlinear decision boundaries and you can go on and arrange this in layers. So what you typically do is you have then some input layer. This is, for example, our vector x. And then you have several perceptrons that you arrange in hidden layers. They're called hidden because they do not immediately observe the input. They assign weights, then compute something, and only at the very end, at the output, you have a layer again where you can observe what's actually happening. All of these weights that are in between in those hidden layers, they are not directly observable. Here, you can only observe them when you put in some input and then compute the activations, and at the very end, you can obtain the output. So this is where you can actually observe what's happening in your system. Now we'll look into the so-called universal function approximation theorem. This is actually just a network with a single hidden layer. Universal function approximation is a fundamental piece of theory because it tells us that with a single hidden layer, we can approximate any continuous function. So let's look at this theorem into a bit more of detail. It starts with this formal definition. We have some phi x, and phi x is a non-constant, bounded, monotonically increasing function. There exists some epsilon greater than zero, and for any continuous function f of x, defined on a compact subset of some high dimensional space, there exists an integer and real constant nu and b and real vectors w where you can find an approximation. So here you can now see how the approximation is computed. You have an inner product of the weights with the input plus some bias. This goes into the activation function phi of x. This is a non-constant bounded monotonically increasing function. Then you have another linear combination using those nu, which then produce the output capital F of x. So capital F of x is our approximation, and the approximation is a linear combination of non-linearities that are computed from linear combinations. If you define it this way, you can actually demonstrate that if you subtract capital F of x from the true function f of x, the absolute difference between the two is bounded by a constant epsilon, and epsilon is greater than zero. That's already a very useful approximation. There is an upper bound epsilon, but right now it doesn't tell us how large epsilon actually is. So epsilon may be really large. The universal approximation theorem also tells us that if we increase n, the epsilon goes down. Now, if you approach infinity with n, epsilon will approach zero. So the more neurons we take in this hidden layer, the better our approximation will get. So this means we can approximate any function with just one hidden layer. So you could argue if you can approximate everything with a single layer, why the hell are people doing deep learning? You know, all those things that you read in textbook and they tell you stay away from this, and they're all wrong. Deep learning doesn't make any sense if a single layer is enough. I've just proved this to you. So there's maybe no need for deep learning. Let's look into some examples. I took a classification tree here, and a classification tree is a method of subdividing space. I'm taking a 2D example here where we have some input space x1 and x2. This is useful because we can visualize it very efficiently here on the slides. Our decision tree does the following thing. It decides whether x1 is greater than 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5
node that I'm showing you the decision boundary here on the right. In the next node, if you go to the left hand side and you look at x2, you decide whether it's greater or smaller than 0.25. On the other side, you simply look again at x1 and decide whether it's greater or smaller than 0.75. Now, if you can do that, you can assign classes in the leaf nodes. In the leaves, you can see now, for example, we assign the value 0 or 1. This gives a subdivision of this space that has the shape of a mirrored L. So this is a function, and this function can now be approximated by a universal function approximator. So let's try to do that. We can transform this actually into a network. Let's use the following idea. Our network has two input neurons because it's a two-dimensional space. With our decision boundaries, we can also form these decisions, x1 being greater or smaller than 0.5. So we can immediately adopt this and we can adopt this to all the other inner nodes. Because we're using a sigmoid in this example, we can also use the inverse of the nodes and put them in as additional neurons. So, of course, I don't have to learn anything here because the connections towards the first hidden layer, I can take them from the tree definition. They are already predefined, so there is no learning required here. On the output side, I have to learn some weights, and this can be done, for example, using a least square approximation, and then I can directly compute those weights. If I go ahead and really do that, we can also find a nice visualization. You can see that with our decision boundaries, we are essentially constructing a basis in the hidden layer. And you can see that if I use 1 and 0 as black and white for every hidden node, I'm constructing a base vector. They are then essentially weighted linearly for the output. So you could do this here by multiplying every pixel with every pixel and then summing this up. And this is what the hidden layer here would do. So I'm essentially interested in combining those space vectors such that it will produce the desired y. Now if I do that in a least square sense, I get the approximation here on the right. So that's not half bad. I can magnify this a little bit. This is what we wanted to get, and this is what we just computed. Now you can see that it kind of has the L shape in there, but the values here are in a domain between 0 and 1, and the epsilon with my 6 neuron approximation here is probably in the range of 0.7. So it kind of does the trick, but the approximation is not very good. In particular, in this configuration, you have to create a large number of neurons in order to get the error down because it's a really hard problem. It can almost not be approximated. So what else could we do? Well, if we want this, we could, for example, add a second nonlinearity. Then we would get exactly the solution that we desire. So you see, maybe one layer is not very efficient in terms of representation. There is an algorithm that can map any decision tree onto a neural network. The algorithm goes as follows. You take all of your inner nodes, so here the decisions between 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and 0 0.75. So these are the inner nodes and then you connect them appropriately. You connect them in a way such that you're able to form exactly the subregions. Here you see that this is our L shape and in order to construct the top left region, we need to have access to the first decision. It separates the space into the left half space and the right half space. Next, we have access to the second decision and this way we can use these two decisions in order to form the small patch on the top left. For all the four patches that emerge from the decision boundaries, 
we essentially get one node. This simply means that for every leaf node, we get one node in the second layer. So one node for every inner node in the first layer and one node for every leaf node in the second layer. Then you combine them in the output. You don't even have to compute anything here because we already know that these have to be merged in order to get the right decision boundaries. This way we manage to convert your decision tree into a neural network and it does exactly the correct approximation as we want it to happen. Science tells us that the stuff that works best is really simple. What do we learn from this example? Well, we can approximate any function with a universal function approximator with just one hidden layer. But if we go deeper, we may find a decomposition of the problem that is just way more efficient. So here, the decomposition was the first inner nodes, then the leaf nodes. This enabled us to derive an algorithm that has only seven nodes and could exactly approximate the problem. So you could argue, by building deeper networks, you add additional steps. In each step, you try to simplify the function and the power of the representation, such that you get better processing towards the decision in the end. I already kind of think of neural nets as a kind of, of program. I think of deep learning as basically learning programs that have more than one step. Now let's go back to our universal function approximation theorem. So we've seen that it exists. It tells us that we can approximate everything with just a single hidden layer. So that's already a pretty cool observation, but it doesn't tell us how to choose n. It doesn't tell us how to train. So there are a lot of problems with the universal approximation theorem. This is essentially the reason why we go to what is called deep learning. Then we can build systems that start disentangling representations over various steps. If we do so, we can build more efficient and more powerful systems and train them end to end. So this is the main reason why we go towards deep learning. I expect anybody who is working in deep learning to know about universal approximation and why deep learning actually makes sense. Okay, so that's it for today. Next time we will talk about activation functions and we'll start introducing the backpropagation algorithm in the next set of videos. So I hope you enjoyed this video lecture and I'm looking forward to see you in the next couple of videos. Bye bye.